Hi, everybody. Good evening and welcome to Evoke Therapy Program's broadcast. I'm Dr. Brad Reedy. Today is Tuesday, October 26th, 2021. Tonight's topic is learning how to deal with school, school refusal. It is a very challenging topic because um, it, it often is the case that the, the leverage that you have for, for kind of behavioral intervention is often something that the child is willing to endure, that, that there's not a lot of leverage that you have in this situation. So I, I know it's a bit of a bait and switch to start off the broadcast with this first idea, but I, I wanted to start it off with some humility because I think this is an extraordinarily challenging and complex situation for people to have to go through. The first thought that I have is I don't know what you should do. I, I don't know ultimately how to predict success or guarantee success. And so hopefully as a therapist, hearing that from a therapist, there's some kind of comfort that is offered there. I think one of the things that can get us really frustrated or upset in our lives is believing that there's a solution out there and that experts know what it is and I just need to find them or, or find it. That doesn't mean I don't have enough content to fill the, fill the hour, but I wanna just start off with that idea about how hard and how difficult it is. The first thing that I wanna talk about tonight is to talk about the idea of the function of the system. Excuse me, to talk about the function of the symptom. In some context, every behavior makes rational sense. Even if in the present context and situation, it makes little to no sense at all. Our job as therapists, our job as parents, our job as, as, as people who care about and, and are invested in other family members, our job is to kind of find that story where it makes sense. It's our job as individuals to find the story where our behavior makes sense. Um, ultimately, the, the, the idea of the function of the system, excuse me, I keep saying system, the idea of the function of the symptom is that the pain of this behavior is better than the pain that would come from not behaving this way. Even the consequence is, is in many cases, it is more desirable or less painful than doing the thing that we're being asked to do. So if we start off from a place of compassion and understanding, we approach the, the, the issue differently. And that's really going to be a fundamental idea in, in tonight's broadcast about regulating your own emotions. If we are upregulated, if it becomes such high stakes, and for many of us parents, the education of our, of our children is so primary in our minds to their survival and success that it does become a high stakes game. And that kind of energy, that kind of anxiety on top of this issue creates a, 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 a kind of high stakes situation and dilemma for the child also. In essence, it, 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 it triggers their nervous system to be upregulated like ours is. And so part of tonight's broadcast is to dial back on that energy, to give some perspective, some insights where we might not have that same kind of reaction. Another point that I want to make about this, and this is maybe even a, a bigger and more arching theme, is that when we're trying to change a child's behavior, that we would spend some time trying to understand the behavior first. And that, that's really where we're starting this evening. Part of the shift in our work at, at Evoke is not giving you solutions or techniques to solve the problem, but really shifting your perspective of, about the problem. And I can't emphasize this too much. What I try to do with you, what I try to do with my clients that I work with one-on-one -on -one, or my clients in the field or the parents that I coach or the intensive clients that I, that I work with is I, I try to give a perspective so that you walk into a situation informed. If I, if I spend time with you, for example, diagnosing your spouse or diagnosing your child or diagnosing your parents or your siblings or your colleagues, part of what I'm saying is that information creates a, a different idea, a different relationship to the problem. First of all, when we're informed in that way, we don't take it personal. It's not as, as much of a threat to us. So part of this evening's goal, one of the goals for this evening is to inform you in such a way that that your, your, your approach starts from a, a different baseline, a different point. 
this next idea, I, I'd rather be in trouble with my parents than continue to feel like an outsider among my peers. Or I'd rather fail than, than, than feel the fear of failure. When there's a high stakes game in, in areas like education or sports or other activities, oftentimes that pressure is so overwhelming for an individual that they'd rather sink their own boat first before somebody else could sink it. It's a way of kind of taking back power over the situation. So a lot of us, we, we all know this, a lot of us are very charged about education. Like I said, obviously I have a PhD. My wife has a master's degree. My oldest child has a master's degree. My second child has a PhD. I still have two children where, where we, we don't know where their education will, will end or stop their formal education. But obviously, it's a value of mine. It's something that I see that adds to, to life choices, to freedom, to opportunities. I, I think it changes you fundamentally. So I could go on and on about my values about education. But, but, but still, we have to shift our perspective. And we have to realize that, that coming at the child, even growing up with a child in that kind of context, can be overwhelming for them. I'm worried about my youngest in the sense that there's not a lot of um, there's not a lot of alternatives examples in our family for her. It seems to be that there's only one way. You go on to college, like like all of her older siblings and, and my wife and I, and, and you even go on to get advanced degrees. So she has nothing to do but just meet the, the bare expectations from that model. So, so we're beginning, you know, we're beginning to look at and understand what, what kind of dynamics are in place that might contribute to a child's anxiety, fear, resistance, and so forth. I gave other examples of, of, of the function of the symptom examples, like in self-harm, I'd, I'd rather cut myself and feel that particular pain than have no feeling at all. I'd rather drink or use drugs, smoke pot and feel this high than feel stressed or bored or insecure or empty. Excuse me. <clears throat> I'd rather piss off my parents than feel the crushing guilt and disappointment of trying to please them and failing. This was really an idea that the, the function of, of the symptom idea was from the first group of family therapists in Palo Alto, California in the late 1960s and early 1970s, where they were going into homes and watching families. And, and one of their first and, and, and most um, consequential hypotheses was it wasn't the problem. It wasn't that somebody was sick. It wasn't that somebody lost their job. It wasn't a learning disability. The problems weren't the problem, but it was the family's attempt to solve the problem that became the problem. They called it an, attempt, an attempted solution sequence. And that the way that they counteracted that, that, that unhealthy attempt to solve a problem is by reframing it in a way where we understood the symptom. We offered compassion and understanding to a symptom, whereas before it was just seen, seen as the problem. In a very simple way, this is something I wrote last week on my social media and shared or a couple of weeks ago. This came out of, out of some recent work that I was doing with, with some folks when they were asking themselves the question about how did they get here? as a family? How did they get to, to, to this issue? Why were the symptoms of family um, created? And, and part of, of the reframe that I gave to them is I invited them to think of it this way. Instead of thinking of your symptom as a problem, you can think of the symptom as the solution. And then you can ask yourself, what problem was it solving? So instead of thinking of, thinking of school refusal as the problem, we start to, to think and ask ourselves and maybe even ask the child, lastly, because they, they might not have, not have access consciously to this information, but we begin to ask ourselves and get curious about what problem is school refusal solving if we think of it as the solution. I, I've mentioned this before in, in Chapter 5 of The Journey of the Heroic Parent. I almost didn't, I mean, frankly, emotionally, I didn't want to write this chapter. I think there are plenty of books out there on behavioral reinforcement, behavioral tools, and I'm going to share a little bit of those this evening. But I started off with this, this idea that if I don't write about it, 
if I don't write about tools for encouraging and facilitating change in children, th that question will be left out there for every reader. So I went into behavioral theory a little bit. But first and foremost, I set the foundation. I set the base. And what I said was this, using behavioral tools is fine, but only if they are nested in love and awareness. And here's the, here's the key point that I'm emphasizing the first few minutes of this broadcast. And we would be wise first to first listen to what the behavior is telling us before we launch into changing it. So with that preamble, if you, if you will, before we get into to kind of behavioral responses and how to shape behavior, um, we're going to talk about oper operant conditioning now, which is a behavioral theory that is very, very old. There are basically four kinds of behavioral reinforcers. Two of them add something. Two of them take it away. One of them encourages behavior. Two, excuse me. Two of them encourage behavior, and two of them discourage behavior. And there are specific strengths and, and weaknesses with each of them. So reinforcement, positive reinforcement is a positive stimulus or response that we add to the equation, add to our child's life in order to increase a certain behavior. We reward good grades. We reward study habits. We reward, we reward uh, completing chores, sticking to a difficult task, right? We reward something, we add something so that behavior will, behavior will increase. Negative reinforcement is to take away something so that behavior will increase. And, and this is a little bit of a complicated one. M my favorite one is the, the speed limit. You know, the speed limit is posted. And the idea is if you follow the speed limit, we won't give you a ticket, right? We're, we're taking away something. We're removing something from the equation. It could be seen as punishment. <clears throat> And I'm going to talk about that very specifically in just a moment. But it's the idea of removing something, some kind of negative s stimulus. Uh, you know, you won't. You, uh, another example would be. I'm having a tickle in my throat this evening, so we're going to have to do some editing, Malia, and you're going to have to be taking some really good notes this evening where I'm coughing and, and clearing my throat. <clears> throat> there might be in a family, for example, a curfew. Excuse me. There might be in a family a curfew. And so with that curfew, um, there, there, there's a consequence. But if, if you show up on time, we'll remove, we'll, we'll remove the curfew. Right? We'll take away something that you see as negative in order to promote responsible coming home, re responsible use of autonomy. Negative, negative punishment. Um, is to take something away to decrease behavior. And in that way, you kind of almost have to put something in place first, right? You have to put a, 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 a negative um, consequence, a negative interaction. Like if you don't do your chores, if, if, you, if, you, if you skip your chores, um, you don't get an allowance. So you take away that allowance when, to, to see the behavior decrease. It's kind of complicated. The most common one is punishment. The one that we think about often. Punishment and reward. Punishment is adding something negative to see behavior decrease. Punishment has more weaknesses in it than the other three. Punishment is... The difficult part about punishment is it tells somebody what not to do, but it doesn't tell them what to do. The example that I gave earlier about a police officer giving you tickets is that people learn to avoid the police officer and police officer and not the behavior we all learn to look in our, our rearview mirrors and scan the highway to see if there's a police officer looking for a police officer parked on the side of the road somewhere so we're learning to escape the punishment but not change the behavior the other weakness of course with punishment is it's cathartic it feels good sometimes to punish somebody, right? It's an outlet for our anger. And so in that sense, punishment can be misused more than the others. 
because it's such a powerful urge to want to make somebody pay when they do something wrong, when they make a mistake. So the weakness is a punishment. It doesn't tell them what to, to do. People can learn to avoid the punishment, not the behavior. And then because of its cathartic nature, we, we might misuse it more than the others. I have a chapter on it. You can read more about it. You can go back to the, the, the podcast that I did on, on chapter five of the journey of the heroic parent and read more about it. That's not the point of showing you the slide and going over it. The point is there's, there's no silver bullet. There's no magic solution. There's nothing too unique about behavioral reinforcement, about shaping. But what is unique about our work, what is unique about Evoke's approach is that we look for layers. We look for depth. We look for something beneath it. I think about this all the time. If my job was just to give people tools and skills, I, I wouldn't need to practice my own therapy. I wouldn't even, even need to keep studying because it's a pretty simple process. Skills and tools can be measured out by a first-year graduate student in therapy. That They're helpful. It's not that they serve no value. It's just that they, 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 they don't reach down to the place where we struggle. Why don't we use them? Why are we resistant? Why don't I want to use an I feel statement? Why don't I want to listen empathically? Like, like, like active listening teaches. Why do I want to give advice? Why do I want to use exaggerative language, right? I always think about when I'm talking, even when I, when, when I hear self-help experts encourage people to be vulnerable, my thought, it, it goes right to, yeah, but why don't we? That's an easy thing to say and not too complicated. But people have very good reasons, for example, for not being vulnerable. And I get fascinated and interested in that more than I do uh, of, of the, the edict the charge, the invitation, the suggestion that we should be vulnerable. Part of our considerations then as we navigate behavioral reinforcers and look for, for skills and look for, you know, maybe it's a token system. You know, maybe there, there are simple rewards that we kind of lay out for the child that, they, that are very desirable to them. That's one of the, the, the important aspects of, of reinforcement theory is that you've got to find something that the child values you know, giving a few dollars to a to a child who who grew up in a, in a wealthy family isn't going to get them to return their library books. But letting them have a day off where they have to wear the school uniform for PE and they can wear their own clothes, that might be very desirable to somebody who comes from more wealth. So you have to find out what what, what matters to them. You also have to learn to, to reward success of approximations, right? You have to learn that there are times to reward steps toward the ultimate goal. So, so with that background again, does it feel like high stakes? Is there a great deal of pressure? Is, is there testing or, or can you get academic testing because there can be a learning difference? There are so many undiagnosed learning disorders that we discover later in life that cause anxiety and lead to school refusal. So if you can get, if you can ask the, the, the school district to provide testing, if you yourself can get testing, that can give, shed a lot of light on what's going on and why a child might be refusing to go to school. Are there other mental health issues that aren't necessarily related to learning differences, learning disabilities? Is there depression? Is there anxiety? Is there situational or, or social anxiety at play? You know, I had some of that growing up. I've been sharing with people lately, not that it's a, a new thing to share, but just it's come up in conversations. I have a good deal of social anxiety. And, and so walking into a, a classroom or walking into a large group can be very overwhelming for me, unless I'm the teacher, <laughs> ironically. If I'm the teacher or the, or the presenter, then I'm not very anxious because I have a role. I, I know what the rules are, but, but chit chat, you know, like small talk, that can be overwhelming. Is there substance use that can decrease motivation, that can distract, that can also lead to a, a, a lack of ability to, to learn? And therefore, it, it mimics a learning disability. 
you know, most important with this one, maybe as much as any issue that I would ever talk about, although it applies to a lot of them, is get support. Find groups, find people who can support you in the process. And I'm not just talking about people that will give you answers and directions about how to solve the problem. They, they can definitely do some of that and walk you through the behavioral reinforcements that I was describing earlier that I kind of fumbled through. But it's difficult and frustrating and upsetting and, and worrisome. And you've got to have somebody help you carry that. My, my daughter, I, I did a presentation yesterday or Sunday in New York City, an all-day presentation. And, and Emma gave part of the presentation during the day. And she was describing at one point that as she evolves, as she learns to confront uh, dysfunctional family patterns, and I'm quite, a, I'm quite aware that that means some of those are mine. As she learns to confront and shift dysfunctional family patterns, she's going to experience a great deal of guilt. And what she said to the audience was, so I need somebody to help me carry that guilt because I've got to walk through it. I've got to sort it out, unpack it. You know, it rests, guilt rests very heavily. Anxiety and fear rests very heavily on us. Frustration rests very heavily. I can't emphasize this enough that you need support. I know I say a lot, work on yourself, go to therapy, go to intensives, go to 12-step support groups, and I'm going to say all of that for sure. But part of what I don't explain is sometimes it's just about having somebody help you carry it. One of the challenges in getting support is when you are not clear or, or the person that you're getting support from is not clear on what the task is. If you go to somebody to, to help you carry the frustration and anxiety and fear and anger and sadness that you have, but they're looking to provide skills and tools that could possibly solve the issue, that's a really important mismatch to understand. You, you know, we have therapists at Evoke that do coaching for us. And one of the things that I, I am clear to, to reinforce, to teach in them, is to explain, look, it's very important to be clear about what the client is asking you for, what the coaching client is asking you for. Because if you come in with solutions and fixes for them, it, it's like an attack on them. In fact, you might be re-traumatizing them by offering suggestions and solutions. And so if they just want to be heard and understood, maybe offered some insight or perspective about the situation, that can be a very different task. So go to a therapist, make it a practice is one of the ways to get support. I, I, I explain this on occasion, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat it here. I go to therapy and have for the last 22 years straight, and before that it was intermittent, for eight or nine years. I go to therapy when I'm doing well, when I'm in crisis, when there's nothing to talk about, when I can't wait because I have so much to talk about. I go to therapy because it's a practice, a discipline. And I don't know which kind of a session it's going to be for me this week, that week. I don't know that sometimes until moments before the session starts. I can get a phone call. I can listen to a message, read an email. I can have a discussion with my, well, my wife, somebody at work, one of my children. That can be triggering for me. And I haven't even anticipated it. But because I have that regular practice of Friday mid-morning, I have a place to go to take care of me. 12-step support groups like Al-Anon, Codependence Anonymous, CODA for short, or ACA, which is Adult Children's Adult Children of Alcoholic or Refuge Recovery, those are examples of place that we encourage you to try out. Six of them. Try six meetings. And see if that's a place that you can go and lay your head down. Rest. You can show up and, and, and the group is bigger than you. And so you can lay out your problems and your stress. I talk about this in couples therapy all the time. Go to individual therapy to, to relieve your, 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 your spouse of the idea that sometimes creeps in that it's their job to take care of you. Yes, we support each other. We help each other. We make compromises. We do all of that for sure. But fundamentally, ultimately, it's not 
your spouse's job to take care of you. So we go there because we want to find somebody bigger. We go there to be seen. Connect with your local chapter of, of NAMI, which stands for the National Alliance on Mental Illness. There are free resources all throughout the country. Go to NAMI.org, find classes, support groups, education, resources to help you. You know, the, the, the last question, kind of the, the nuclear option when it comes to school refusal, some of my listeners will have will not be able to relate to the, this at all. My, my live listeners who are part of the Evoke family will definitely be able to relate to this, this in one way or the other. But the part of the question is, do you have the resources for an inpatient placement with your child? Therapeutic boarding school, residential treatment center, wilderness therapy. Because part of what, what that does for children is it's, it's all-encompassing. It's not just a session once or twice a week or a group on Monday nights. There, there's a there's a there's a box there's a container there's there's ubiquitous support for the child in their world to kind of help them where they need to go and so if for example at a re residential treatment center or a therapeutic boarding school they refuse to go to school all hands are on deck and, and your emotional emotionality is removed from the equation to a large degree i haven't said this in a while but one of the greatest mistakes that parents make when thinking about all of the kind of help that we talk about at Evoke, including our wilderness therapy program, is that because you love them the most, you know them the best, you're, you're the most helpful. I have no doubt that virtually all of our parents love their children more than we do. I know I love my children more than any other person could besides my wife. Nobody's going to come anywhere close to how much my wife and I love our children or, or my ex-wife with my two older children. Nobody's gonna, gonna come close to that. But sometimes that makes it so that we can't see the forest for the trees, right? There's a dynamic, there, there are issues involved in that. And so part of, of asking somebody else to assist, whether it be a, a baseball coach, a soccer coach, a violin teacher, a math teacher, a residential treatment program or a wilderness program, part of the advantage is that they're detached enough to have some objectivity with the child. And that the child's not going to react or is less likely, I should, to react to, to push them away, to, to fail or to sabotage thing, to, to experience some independence from their therapist in the wilderness or from their therapist at a residential boarding school or, or the staff, the frontline staff. So if you have that option, I've said this recently, if you have that option, it can be somewhere that you go to. And, and while I don't think that outpatient therapy is what a lot of adolescents need and benefit from, especially those or primarily those who don't want to go, I really have come to believe that mentoring works better. But the reason that, that these, these kinds of programs work is because it's, it's all encompassing. It's a large container. It's more than just the therapy. It's the entire system. If you haven't seen Goodwill hunting, I'm going to ruin part of it for you. Um, but I, I think it's, it's one of those movies recent enough that, that most people have seen it. The scene that I'm going to talk about tonight is the scene in the bar between Sean, who's played by Robin Williams, and his colleague. And the bartender plays a role in it, too. And, and Sean's colleague, the, the mathematician, Dr. Lambeau, he's putting a lot of pressure on, on Sean, the therapist, to try to fix Will. Will Hunting is his name. To try to get him to, to reach his potential academically. And again, it's that high stakes. You have to do this. You owe it to me. You owe it to the world. To, to reach your full potential mathematically because because Will Hunting is essentially a genius in many areas, math being one of them. So that's the scene. And as they have this debate, it goes like this. Sean, therapist played by Rob Williams, says, Hey, Jerry, in the 1960s, there was a young man who graduated from the University of Michigan, did some brilliant work in mathematics, specifically bond, uh, bounded harmonic functions. Then he went on to Berkeley. He was an assistant professor 
showed amazing potential. Then he moved to Montana and blew the competition away. Dr. Lambeau, his friend and colleague, says, yeah, so who was he? Sean says, Ted Kaczynski. Dr. Lambeau says, haven't heard of him. Sean then yells to the bartender, hey, Timmy. Bartender says, yo. Sean says, who's Ted Kaczynski? And Timmy says, the Unabomber. The point that he's trying to make in this story is that if academics takes priority over mental health, it's a disaster. I spend so much of my time with parents over the years, probably one of the two or, or three most common discussions, di dialogues, dynamics that we, that we unfold together is to deprioritize academics and academic success on the ladder of life by two or three rungs. Again, I told you about my family system for a reason and our emphasis on academics because I want you to know that I value it. So I, I'm not coming from, from the perspective that education isn't, isn't important and potentially life-changing. But more fundamental than that, more fundamental than that is mental health. I know it's only anecdotal but it's a relevant and, and, and close anecdote. It's my life. I am a high school dropout with a PhD. What I could not have told you back when I was dropping out of high school halfway th through the 10th grade, what I could not have told you was part of what I was trying to escape was the expectation that I achieve at the highest level. I couldn't tolerate an A minus or a B plus. Worse than that, in some cases, I couldn't tolerate having the second best paper or the second best test score or the second best overall score in the class. And so I, I sabotaged my high school career and I dropped out because it was too much pressure. And I had all of my emotional eggs in that basket. I'd been told so much how bright I was, how much potential that, that I had, that I thought anything less than the best would be a failure. I couldn't have told you that. You could have given me truth serum at the time, and it wouldn't have come out of me. I can only see that now, looking back and watching it play out in my life now and again, even as an adult, with a lot of ages, with a lot of years behind me. So Part of, of what I, I, I wish had happened is that somebody saw me. Somebody was able to, to tap in and to see what was going on and give me some relief and give me a new idea and a new perspective. But nobody was available to me for that. My mother tried. She took me to family therapy individual, and, and, and individual therapy, but nobody was able to crack that code. I was only able to crack it years later. So when I went back as an adult, and got a got a, a some sort of equivalency high school degree, and then was basically gifted entrance into a college to a university. I was able to excel because my mental health, my development caught up, my maturity caught up with me, and I was able to to accomplish and, and be successful. When my son was struggling, my firstborn was was struggling. It was, it was scary, overwhelming, frustrating. You know, I came into parenting like most people thinking, I'm going to get this right. I'm going to at least do it better than my father. I'm going to educate myself. I'm going to do my own work. And in the course of doing my own work, this epiphany w w was born. One time when I was talking about things with my son and how difficult and scary things were getting, including school performance and school participation, and grades, my therapist just simply asked me the question. She said, what's most important to you? What's, what's the, the, the ultimate goal for you? And I said, I want to be a resource to him. I want to be somebody he calls in a crisis. I want to be somebody that he feels safe with. And she said something really simple to me. She said, that's a really worthy goal. Keep that in mind when you're parenting. And so perspectives shifted. That became more important than school. 
that even became more important than substance use. The connection, the quality of the relationship began to be my focus. And I'm not taking credit for the choices that he made. But I definitely know that that shift in emphasis changed the energy, changed the, the anxiety in the family, changed my focus, changed my behavior. She did not, just to note, my therapist did not tell me what to do and virtually has never in 22 years told me what to do. But she helped me reconsider the frame, reconsider the idea, reconsider parenting. In a very sim similar sense, Madeline Levine, the author of The Price of Privilege, says this. She said, it is emotional, emotional closeness. It is emotional closeness. But eternal warmth in particular, she, st she states, that is as close to, as we get to a silver bullet against psychological impairment. So we kind of have to be willing to deprioritize some things, to let go of some things in the short term. We have to play the long game. I talk about this idea from the journey of the heroic parent. How we think about our children is more important than what we do to them. The quality of an intervention or a behavioral technique is not as important as how we hold our children in our mind. If we see them as bad, broken, or sick, it doesn't matter what we do. Our anxiety will leak out subtly. And all they will see is that we think that they are bad. It is critical that we learn to see them and their goodness, even when their behavior makes it difficult. So I wish I had magic answers, silver bullets. You can go back to, to behavioral theory. You can look at the function of the symptom. But, but most importantly, it is to shift emphasis, to make the biggest goal, the most important goal, the, 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 the first priority in your relationship with your child. A safe container, a different perspective. You know, I talked about this on Sunday at, at our parenting workshop. Um, one of the most difficult burdens for a child to bear is the disowned anxiety of a parent. If you are anxious, and I suspect that you are, I am, if you are anxious, and instead of owning that anxiety, at whatever level it is, you make the child the problem and then the solution, that is akin to asking the child to carry your wound, to carry your mental illness, to carry your symptomology. And that rests, risks, excuse me, that rests extraordinarily heavy on the shoulders of a child. Get help. Find resources. If you're able to, wilderness therapy can be a great reset and restart, a great assessment. Get testing if you can. Do your best to rule out learning dif difficulties, learning disorders, learning styles. Become a pain in your school districts behind. Become a fierce advocate. One of my favorite stories is from one of our therapists, M Mikey Mean. He's actually moved on now. He's working inside now. He's given up the great outdoors after many years and working inside. And he tells the story of his mother. It's a family full of uh, educators and a family full of people with ADHD. And they had all kinds of creative ways of helping the children with ADHD. And one of the simple ones was the mother advocated for schools to allow Mikey to stand in the back of the class and to pace. If you've had a phone call, a parent phone call with Mikey, you've heard it, right? You've heard him breathing and walking around. Because that's how he deals with the excess energy of, of ADHD. But it, he said it took a fierce and, and relentless mother. Bottom line, when the child's mental health is, is addressed, 
when the child begins to heal, the rest of it falls into place. There was a great public service announcement that I remember as a child. I've told this story before. It showed a father reading the newspaper back when people read the newspaper and a child trying to get his father's attention. And in order to buy some time and alleviate some of his frustration, the father ripped the back page of the newspaper off where there was a a picture of of the globe, uh, of the entire world. He ripped it into pieces and he gave it to his son. He said, put this globe, put this puzzle uh, of this globe back together. And when you're done, we'll play together. And moments later, the child returned and the puzzle was fixed. And the father said, how did you do it so fast? And the son said, on the other side uh, of the, the globe, there was a picture of the family. And when I put that together, the globe, the world was already together. It's a cute little commercial and a little bit too simplistic. But it's important that, like they say in recovery from substances and, and from codependency, we learn to put first things first. We, we learn to change our priorities. We learn to own and be responsible for our own serenity. If the child doing well is is seen consciously or not, as our pathway toward peace and serenity, the child will feel that. The private school that my children have gone to is, is littered just everywhere with children carrying the anxiety of accomplishment. In The Price of Privilege, Dr. Levine talks about parents on the Upper East Side of Manhattan looking into preschools before their children are born. We, we, we associate academic and career success so much with success that sometimes we just use it as a substitute, we talk about successful people. And if we're not asking or talking or thinking critically, we all kind of know what people are describing. Now, with our awareness of mental health, as it's evolving these days, if somebody says this or that person is successful, we would say, in what way are they successful? But there is a history and a culture that was passed down to us that we sometimes pass down to our children, that academic school success, career success is success. My therapist tells a story one time. She remembers this. By the way, she used to refer to her, her son Anthony as her worthless son Anthony. And she did it as an irony to, to, to talk about how successful and talented he was. But he was in a private school here in Salt Lake City. Anthony was. And there was a particular time when he was putting off his assignments somewhere around the 10th grade, playing video games, playing with friends and putting off his assignments. And Jamie, my therapist said to him, if you don't learn to do your work first, if you don't learn to complete your assignments first, you're never going to amount to anything. And she shares this story as a confession of really, really Poor parenting, a a, a parenting that creates high stakes for a child. That's essentially a a, a critical part of of, of shame and and trauma and the anxiety that's often present in families. We make it pass or fail. We make it something that if, if you don't do we, 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 we future trip, right? We, we, we tell the child, or at least we imagine, the cascade of dominoes that will fall if the child doesn't do well in 7th grade or 8th grade or ninth grade or 10th grade or 12th grade or college or graduate school. We, 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 we describe this cascade, uh, uh, this, this cascade of falling dominoes to our children because we think that, the, that our fear that we're putting into them will inspire them to run even faster. But we're starting to learn as a culture 
that that kind of motivation can be not just toxic, but devastating. That's in part what Simone Biles was suffering from. The stakes for her were at the highest level. The only way that Simone Biles could have succeeded, and, and it would have felt more like a relief to her than anything, is if she won a gold medal in every single event that she was in. That's the kind of energy that sometimes we bring to our children. So we have to shift. We have to move out of this, this, this superficial level of consciousness. We have to go down deep and understand why is the child refusing? What's going on? What are the dynamics in play? How am I contributing to it? And you know what? The more questions you ask like that, the more your energy is consumed by doing your work. And just that fact that you have a project and that, that you are that project provides the child with some relief. Nobody likes to be the project. Nobody likes to be somebody else's project. And that includes our children. And when we try to inspire them by instilling uh, large amounts of fear and anxiety into them, we're essentially traumatizing them. I, you know, again, I didn't have a, a strict family that I grew up in. That wasn't the problem. And it, and it, it often never is. You know, it, it's, it's what's behind and around the strictness that's the problem. <clears throat> but what I did have was an identity that was it was a, a, associated with the highest level of success. And anything short of that was failure. And as we learned from the, the, the research on the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset, that children that are told that they're that they have potential or that they're gifted are ruined by that message. And so part of that science, the science of the fixed mindset, which is you're either good at math or you're not, you're gifted or you're not. What, what that science tells us is that those expectations are too great for, for a child to bear. But when a child learns how they can learn, when a child is encouraged to, to make mistakes, when the stakes of a, a pass or fail are, are lowered, when the stakes are celebrated, when you model mistakes, that's why it's so important for you to apologize. Not because of the thing that you're apologizing for. That's, that's helpful. But because you're showing your child what it's like to be human. But because we were traumatized in this same way, we try to hold tightly to this idea that we have the answers, that we've got it figured out. And we think that, that that presentation gives us authority with our children. That's what we think. We think that that by being so good and so right and so capable and so accomplished and having it figured out and having the answers, we think that that, that, that idea, that sensibility, that presentation gives us to the authority to tell our children what to do. But it can be so harmful. What children need is human parents, not good ones. They need a parent who can embrace and celebrate setbacks and mistakes and sidetracks and detours. Because those things that I just described, that's the work of becoming a self. And, and the school system isn't set up for that. You know, at this private school that my children went to, my, my third child uh, graduated from there, my my. My fourth child has opted out for this, this, this year for the first time. That school itself fosters this kind of thinking. The, the amount of homework, the amount of pressure, the amount of comparison. They talk about college and grade school. It's too much. And frankly, it's not the most important thing or the second or the third most important thing. And that's coming from somebody, like I said, who has a PhD with several family members with advanced degrees. That's somebody who values education. 
So we have to shift. We have to go deeper. We have to go beneath the behavior, beneath the symptoms. Look at the dynamics. Find the story where their school refusal makes sense. If you need outside help and you do, get it. If you need to place your child and you can do that in a residential therapeutic boarding school or wilderness therapy program, that can be a helpful assistance to you. Alice Miller, who wrote the drama of The Gift of Child, as you probably know, my favorite book on parenting and children, really on children. Um, she makes it clear that, that, a, that a mother, it was written in 1979, so it was always mothers back then, but a mother can provide for a child what the child needs, even if she's not especially warm and nurturing. Only, or excuse me, if she allows that child to get it from somewhere else. Even John Bowlby, the father of attachment theory, said that, that, that boarding schools can be helpful and an important part of attachment. So all of our preconceived notions about getting outside help, both because of our own shame and because of the ideas that we've failed, that it will confront our, our, our or expose our failure, that's a block to us helping the child get to what they need. I remember back in the day when my son was in wilderness therapy, my oldest, my 28-year-old, he was 13 at the time. And I remember when one of my children, one of the, the children in my group, one of the students I was working with was struggling severely. And the father had planned a mission trip for many years, saved up for it, and, and planned a mission trip. He, he asked me if he should cancel it, if he should come to Utah. And I simply said to him, I don't think, I think we got it. And I said to him, and, and, and tears filled my eyes when I said it, I said, here's the deal. I'll take care of your son. Someone else is taking care of my son. And you go take care of the, those children on your mission. That's kind of the way that the world works. Or at least that's the way that it's working with us, for us all right now. So I, I, I hope this has been helpful. I, I, I know that I didn't give you magic solutions. I hope that even my not knowing what you should do, but rather in, in informing you about the, the sensibility, the approach, the thought process, really the way of being that, 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 that we can adopt, that can fill us up. I hope that that informs you in such a way that you can feel differently, that you can approach it differently, and that you can reset your project from fixing the child to fixing yourself. I hope it's helpful. I'm happy to take any questions that have come in. Somebody writes, sometimes I feel that my 16-year-old daughter could benefit from the positive reinforcement of me telling her that I'm proud of her, hard work, et cetera, hard work at school and volleyball, et cetera. Yes, Yet I know from everything you've spoken of that, it's, that it is wrong to tell your kids that you're proud of them because they will know that you can also be disappointed in them. My question is, what if my child at certain times needs to just hear that we are proud, happy, etc.? How can I best express this without damaging them in the long run? I'm so glad you asked this question. It's one of the things that I teach that I think gets misunderstood. So I'm going to go over a few things. Number one, you're allowed to give your children praise. That's not what I'm saying. You're allowed to, to reinforce or encourage them by praising them. Good job. Good effort. Way to go. Nice job. Congratulations. Those can be helpful. Tone down the emotional energy with it, right? So it doesn't feel like high stakes. That's the second principle. The third principle is that proud of them makes it about you. One of the, the, the great writers in this area, Dr. Daniel Siegel, talks about this in, in Parenting from the Outside, Inside Out. He says that the praise is almost so intense that it is, it is almost like the parent is, is accomplishing the thing. And I suppose it's okay to say that you're proud of your child as long as you're proud of them when they fail. See, that's the thing. It's not that you can't praise or encourage or be excited or maybe even be proud, although... That's not a word that I choose to use. I do think it loads too heavily on children, makes them responsible for how I feel about them and myself. But I suppose the, 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 the solution can be 
The goal is to see all of them. See, that's the answer. I, I, I tell the story, and it's my favorite example, because Bob Dylan was my hero growing up, of listening to, to a reporter describe on the radio an interview with Bob Dylan where a reporter asked the question, are you proud of your son Jacob? with his number one album and his accomplishments. And Bob Dylan said, it's irrelevant. It makes no difference. I'm confident that Jacob didn't feel unsupported by his father or didn't think that his, or thought that his father didn't care or, or, I, I'm, or that his father didn't grad, can congratulate him for his hard work and his efforts and his, his, his musical talent and abilities and practice and so forth. But what Bob was trying to teach us was that's not the point. So yeah, if you're going to be excited, be excited for their failures. Like the story that I've told, you can Google this. The CEO of Spanx, you might know that, that, that underclothing, um, that under, under clothing wear, she would say, she, she, she told the story that her father would ask each of the family members to share a failure that they'd experienced that day. And when they did, he would toast to them and congratulate them for trying. And when they didn't have a failure, he would kind of act nonplussed, a little bit disappointed. He was trying to teach them that failure is good too. Failure is important too. You know, I remember when Emma, my daughter, decided to take a semester off after a, a, a really difficult breakup. And I remember thinking, oh, this is off track and you need to stay on track. But I mustered all the capacity that I had. And I said, of course, you can take a semester off. If that's what you need, I can support you. And it was that semester that Emma, Emma came to assist me at the first several intensives. And after a day in her first intensive with me, which she would not have been able to do had she been in school, she said, I now know what I want to do my entire life. And so the failure, the, 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 the sidetrack, the detour was part of the journey. And so it, it's not about the verbiage or, or, or the words you use. I prefer not to use the word proud. But it's about the energy. That's what I'm describing. The story of the young man, the young adult man who finished all a bunch of assignments in the first week. And I was out there providing supervision for his therapist. And the therapist was over the top excited and congratulatory of the work. And after the session ended, I said, be careful. Because what if next week he, he doesn't do it and he fails or he gets stuck? Will you then be disappointed? Will he think that he's let you down? And that's really what that kind of energy, that, that proud of you energy can do. And the therapist reassured me, no, 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 he's fine. This, this is a good thing. Two or three weeks later, I was sitting with the parent, coincidentally, at a parent support group in the Bay Area, and the father told me, my, my son has always tried to live up to my success, always tried to make me proud, never felt good enough. My success has, has, for him, become this, this burden that he either has to, to, to match or his life is going to be meaningless. So the word, when I talk about this, and, and this is one of the things that, that I get asked about and quoted the most, it's the, it's the proud of you energy. It's what it can mean. But yes, children need encouragement. They benefit from it. And they also need to know that when they fail, when they flop, when they, when they get sidetracked, that that's not a disaster and that our energy needs to, to, to communicate that at the same time also. So thank you so much for asking. Somebody says, suggestions on dealing with school? Question mark. If I hear he needs therapy one more time, my head may explode. He should be at a residential treatment center, therapeutic boarding, but financially not an option. So public school is our only option. Then all of the other suggestions that I, I, I offered, testing, school district funding, school district testing, an IEP. But, but, but what I'm hearing is that you need support. I, I, I don't think therapy 
is a very effective route for many, many teenage outpatient therapy is an effective route for many, for the majority of teenagers, unless they really want it, unless they're asking or they're motivated. But to, to, to impose therapy on, on, a, on an adolescent doesn't make sense in so many ways. My therapy takes a tremendous amount of effort on my part for it to be meaningful and successful. If I was being forced or threatened to go, you better believe that the, 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 the quality, the outcomes, the benefit of therapy would be reduced dramatically to, to what I would guess would be almost no benefit. So that's why I say you go to therapy and get support, not because you're sick or crazy or the problem or the cause, but because therapy is a place where you can get support. It's your hour. And if you can't afford it, go to the support groups that I mentioned. Let them be your therapist. Let them be your container. So, and, and, and as a therapist, and, and even when I do coaching, one of the things that I'm aware of when a client, when a parent is talking about the frustration is just to be with them in it and to be slow to offer simple solutions or techniques that are phenomenally discounting of the complexity and the difficulty uh, of the human experience. But instead, I just listen and say, I'm glad you're talking about it. Thanks for telling me. I'm so sorry. It's hard. I wish I could take it away. I know I can't, but I wish I could. And in that way, they feel seen and understood and valued. I think that's it for now. Is that it? All right, I'll go up to upcoming events. And then I'll, I'll come back if there are any questions. My two books, The Journey of the Heroic Parent and The Audacity to View, are on Audible and Amazon. I read The Audacity to Be You. Um, support groups for parents. This is a place where you can go to get support. For our wilderness current families and our alumni families, the next offering is October 28th. So that's in a couple of days at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. You can go to our website for all of this. For our intensives alumni, it's November 9th at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. And we have a once a month alumni only meeting, wilderness alumni only meeting. Our next offering is November 23rd at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Email malia at evoketherapy.com for more information. If you want to do a deep dive to, to unravel, unpack the messages, the programming, the trauma that was passed on to you, was passed on to your parents from their parents and so on and so on. The next deep dive opportunity of finding you in person is November 10th through 14th. If you want an online option, which is half the time, less than half the cost, it comes in two parts, November 5th through 7th. It's a great option if time and financial resources are, are limited. We'll be talking about another returning to you. Just email intensives at evoketherapy.com. If you want a, an attachment-based um, therapist for coaching, we have coaches at Evoke. We have people that, that practice coaching. Just email coaching at evoketherapy.com. It can be for parenting issues, other relationship issues, even dealing with the discovery of yourself in the process. We have pursuits and adventure trips for individuals, adults, and families, anywhere from three to 30 days. This can be in between programs, separate from programs. You don't even have to be in a family for all of these other programs. We ask all current families to go to 12, six, excuse me. I always struggle with that. We ask all families. We encourage all families. I encourage all listeners. If you want support and need support to attend six 12 step support groups. I had somebody walk up to me on Sunday and say, thank you for making that, that suggestion. It's changed my life. And that's not, at all the first time I've been told that. Any combination of alanon.org, coda.org, familiesanonymous.org, adultchildren.org, refugerecovery.org, or nami.org. Those are great free resources in your area. You can find all of these broadcasts on your favorite podcast app. Just search Finding You in Evoke Therapy Podcast or go to soundcloud.com and search Finding You there. On Twitter and Instagram, you can find us by using the handle at Evoke Therapy or at Dr. Brad Reedy. On Instagram, you can also find our intensive program. 
using the handle at Evoke Therapy Intensives. On Facebook, just search Evoke Therapy Programs or Evoke Therapy Intensives or go to our Evoke blog that has new content cur curated wonderfully by our, our moderator, Malia, each week, new content each week. Our next broadcast will be next week, November 2nd at 6.30 p.m. It'll be a live Q&A. This can be for your family and friends, for siblings of the child at home, for uh, for any and all of those folks. Or if you just want to ask any question on any topic, I'm happy to look at those. Thank you for joining me this evening. I hope this has been a helpful point of contact. Sorry I didn't have the, 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 the magic solutions, but I hope some of the thoughts, some of the ideas can invite you and inform you in such a way that, that you think about, feel differently about, and approach the situation with a different perspective and with your own creativity, really, finding your own solutions. All right, folks, take care. Have a great evening, and I'll talk to you in a few days. Bye-bye.